Hello and thanks for joining us. Welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Duluale. The insurgency in the Northeast has now been on for more than a decade with the attendant consequences of displacement of large numbers of residents as well as damage to property and institutions. What really is going on in that part of the country now? And how has the Nigerian army fared within this period? How is the situation to be tackled for positive outcomes? My guest represents Bordeaux South in the upper house and as chairman of the Senate Committee on Army, Mohammed Ali Unjume. Distinguished Senator Ali Unjume, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, let me start off by taking you home mm. to the Northeast, and particularly to Borno State. Those of us who are not residents of Borno, we rely mostly on what we are told and what we read and the reports we get. What is the real situation with regards to this insurgency that has ravaged Borno and the Northeast in general for about a decade? What is the situation today? The security situation in Borno is getting worse. Worse? Yes. Not better? Not better. It used to be better because at one time, <clears throat> We can virtually say there was no Borno before this government came into power. By 2015, Boko Haram had taken over 22, most 22 local government, mostly, in Borno, or have affected. With the coming of this government of uh, President Mohamed Buhari, Boko Haram, the, the government was able to chase Boko Haram out of Medjugorje and other local government and recaptured it. But by then, people have run away, and even the villagers have run away, and most of, or almost like everybody was either in Meduguri, Mongono, even Mongono people at one time were not there. So Meduguri was only the place that was standing. Then the Nigerian armed forces went in, chased them out, hold their position, as they said, and the Boko Haram ran out and left to various, uh, you know, basically Sabisa then. And then some of them rushed to the Mandara Mountain. And then they were scattered somehow, and from there they were launching attacks. But the Nigerian army took the fight to them in Sambisa. From there, some ran to the Lake Chad fringes. And then they had that faction again, where Mohammed, um, somebody Yusuf uh, broke off and uh, Sekau, as we said, they had two factions. Then uh, Iswab, they formed Iswab from the Lake Chad fringes. And then Sekau was holding on to, or is holding on to Sambisa and, uh, and the Mandara Mountains. That is the situation in terms of the activities of the insurgents. That's Boko Haram, as I'm telling you. But, you know, the consequence of what the insurgents did, ravaging and, you know, destroying Borno State, particularly with Borno, which is the epicenter of Boko Haram, by the World Bank estimate, which is authentic, by the time Boko Haram were chased out, they have inflicted a $9.2 billion destruction on Borno State alone. That translates to over 2.7 trillion, you know. And as I said, most local government, 1.7 million people in the northeast were displayed. The humanitarian crisis is there. At one time, when the vice president went and we were told that there are 60 orphans, that is children that don't know their parents, languishing in the camp, we didn't agree. I myself didn't agree. But we went with the vice president. When we did our counting, we got, I think, 50-something thousand people, children that don't even know where their parents are. The humanitarian crisis in Borno State alone, under, you know, you now, you now have the, what they call the ONCHA, the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, yes. estimated that this year alone for them to execute some of the projects that are necessary as a humanitarian to solve the humanitarian crisis in Borno. They were looking for over $800 million. 
if you translate that into Naira, it's a big money. So the crisis, or in short, what I'm saying, the number of lives lost, we cannot truly account for it now. We can only guess. Because people are dying, people have been killed, people are slaughtered, people were, it's just like that. And you know, as majority are Muslims in our place, when somebody is killed, you just go and bury him. You don't report this, so there is no adequate statistics. And then people are cramped all the villages have been destroyed. So most of them are living in Meduguri now under the host communities. Those that are in the camp are just very small. Maybe just 30% of the displaced persons are living in the camps. Even now it's less than that. Because it is not the, in character of an average Nigerian to go and stay somewhere in the camp and waiting for a meal. Or they queue up. There was a time we went to a, 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 a village that was ravaged by Boko Haram to give them... A, humanitarian support, and we asked them to line up. The men started crying, because it's not in our character. A, poor, a Nigerian, average Nigerian, or anywhere poor man would want to go to his farm and were surviving on subsistence farming. Yes. So if anybody tell you the level of destruction in, Medu in Borno State, we, you, you people will not appreciate it, unless you go and see for your eyes. Today, I'm assuring you that only God knows the number of kids, children that would have died as a result of hunger or hunger-related issues today. That's, that's, that's disheartening. But I guess it is this background that brought about the clamor and then the eventual establishment of the Northeast Development Commission. Uh, initially, when it was proposed, other regions said, why only Northeast? Uh, every region should have a development commission. But eventually, the politics was removed and the actual need was determined and that commission was set up. Has it made any kind of difference yet to this situation you've just described? Not yet, but I attribute that not to the inability of the organization to function. Number one, they are new. Number two, there is a challenge too in even the environmental issues these in in the locations here how do you, we how do you mean what, what, you know like it is not easy to assess certain okay, places the places now. where the people who are to be looked after are ah are not easily accessible that is one two and as i said uh, they are just starting so they are busy now addressing the immediate humanitarian you know, needs of the people. I will say they are, I think it's too early to assess their performance because they are barely, you know, when they got the money, barely, I think, three, four months or six months now at most. Uh, so I believe that the Northeast Development Commission will go a long way in elaborating the sufferings of the people and trying to help in rebuilding the Northeast. But I'm not impressed with the funding. I have been crying out on that. This is, a Borno State, for example, not to talk of the Northeast. In Borno State alone, as I said, authentically $9.2 billion dollars worth of damage. damage have been done. That translates to over $2.7 and here you are, the government is budgeting, for example, this year, 38 billion naira only. While the humanitarian development partners that are not directly affected, that is not in their country, that is not their brothers and sisters that are affected. Countries like US, London, uh, Germany, UK and that, who every year raise money. So far, I have been following, there is a financial tracking system that they have. The last time I checked, took a look at it, they have, uh, you know, contributed over five hundred uh, million dollars. If you you multiply that out in naira, it's bigger than you know. The amount is much more than what Nigerian government is putting into. The humanitarian crisis in our area is very serious. Not only that, in terms of feeding and keeping people alive. We have children that have not been able to go to school for the past 10 years. 
and it's an explosive population. These people will have to move out when they grow up. The space there cannot keep them. Once they start, people start growing up, they go out. And once they go out without education, without they knowing their parents, without parental care, without parental discipline, that is dangerous. So the society needs to stand up to look at this issue. I have said it several times, that the most unfortunate thing about this issue of insurgency and now banditry is the fact that every time in this country of ours, unfortunate incidences like this come up. People look at it as Borno State problem. That was the problem we initially had. That was why we were not even able to nip the, 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 nip it by the, by the board. Because initially, you know, in Nigeria, and that is what they do, sensitive matters, security matters, issues that has to do with criminality. People will bring in a tribalism into it, politics into it, and, and religion into it. Recently I heard it. It's good that our people, because of frustration, they go out of the street. So, but what would I would say now? Is it only when they kill the Christian that you go out on the street? People have been killed. It doesn't matter whether that person is killed, he is a Christian or a Muslim. Nigeria should come out to protest. That is if they want to do a peaceful protest. That way you keep us united. After all, most of this religion, people just find themselves in that religion. Supposing Christianity came through the north, Northerners would have been the Christians. And if Islam had come through the South, Southerners would have been the Christians. How did you get Christians in the Southwest? It's because I read historically that some uh, Arabs came through Lagos and as traders or something, they brought the religion. That's why you find Lagos people. Did we inherit it? We imported the religion and now we are fighting over it. Have you ever had them fighting out there? Only the, the Protestant and the Catholic in this Irish something. Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. But that has gone too. It's very unfortunate what is happening in this country. And as you can see now, because we are not being able to contain ourselves, once there is no unity, once there is no equal rights and justice, then Peace will be threatened everywhere. Now, um, Senator, in the chair uh, that you're sitting in another interview was uh, General Ishola Williams. Yeah. And he said something that I found astounding. He said the way that the country has gone about tackling the insurgency the in the Northeast, particularly Boko Haram uh, in, in Borno, has been wrong because they've refused to understand what it is about. And he mentioned two things. He said, first, Boko, uh, uh, Boko Haram is not interested in capturing the Northeast. For whatever strategic reason, they are interested only in Borno. They want Maiduguri. Yeah. Second, that virtually everyone in Boko Haram is Kanuri. And that if you find non kanuris in Boko Haram, they're usually mercenaries paid for specific tasks. And that as a result, the approach to tackling this must bear these two things in mind. Yeah. But that so far, they haven't. Which then brings me to, the, to this issue. Have we been tackling this right? Ever since Muhammad Yusuf, the original founder of uh, Boko Haram, was uh, killed in suspicious circumstances, let's put it that way, for more than a decade, this problem has refused to go away. So, is it that we are approaching it wrong? And if so, what are we then to do? Well, I can say that uh, the issue of Boko Haram was mismanaged up initial. Because I remember when Muhammad Yusuf was preaching around the madras that they call, and um, they, he, were, he had a lot of youthful followership. Then they had an issue with the authority as to the wearing of helmet that was introduced on Akada riders then. And they say because they are wearing these, uh, uh, what do you call it? The turbans. The turbans. They say they won't wear helmet. So they had scheme, you know, with, with the police and I think they lost some of their members they, you know, in the exchange of fire or something like that. But they had no arms then. 
And then Muhammad Yusuf, before he died, was calling out to say that, look, if the authorities do not take measures on their members that were killed, they will, you know, get to the street and take vengeance. Nothing was done. Before you know, Muhammad Yusuf, they were using uh, these uh, improvised explosives, using petrol bombs and all that. They went and demonstrated, had issues with police, and that was the beginning. Before you know, it got out of hand. Ahmed Yusuf was calling on other Muslims or his followers elsewhere that they should come. They, is in, they are going on jihad. That was how they coined it. Even that time, they didn't have arms. Anyway, it wouldn't have gotten to this level, but for the way the government managed it that time. Now that it has gotten to this stage, the government must be serious. As I said, I believe that Boko Haram cannot, can be eliminated even in the fringes on, on the land in Nigeria. They can. The, the, the Nigerian security forces can do that. Because I'm, but I am not still impressed with the level of commitment of the Nigerian government to the fight or to end this insurgency. You and now, no, yeah. And now we have the banditry coming out and other forms of criminalities. You know why? Because there are so many things going on there now. Arms, there's arm proliferation, there's arm, you know, ammunitions coming here and there from Libya, Mali, Niger and others. Now there is this strong Islamic uh, terrorist group, uh, ISIS, supporting ISWAP. They get, they have money from where they can get, and they are putting money on their heads. You know, we have some, you know, uh, dangerous security information these days that I won't be able to even disclose on this interview, because monies are coming from, you know, outside through ISIS and ISWAP. The other one is weaker, the Sekau side that is in Sambisa and Mondara Mountain. But all these groups now, the good thing about it is they have been confined to known three locations. That is one, the Lake Chad fringes, and those are occupied by the ISWAP that are the most dangerous. And they have the resources because they do economic, they are even in economic war, there is even economic warfare going on there now. Because that Lake Chad area, you know, it's an area they control the cattle, they control the, the fishing activities there and other businesses. They, they make money. But the other ones are depending on robberies and you know, roadblocks and kidnapping in, in, the, in the other axis. And the, the few ones that are in, on Mandara Mountain too, the way I see it, because it's in my local government, they are weak ones. They come and steal, they are so hungry, and they can be you know, flushed out. But, as I said, that big theater, the Operation Lafia Dole Theater, covers a big, you know, land. It's not like in the west or deep east where you, there is forest. You know, where there is forest, you can't go anywhere. You have to follow the route. Because in the forest, there is no way anyway. But in, uh, in, in, in the north there, in the Sahara and the desert, you can go to a point, a particular point, from anywhere you can go, as long as you know your bearing, that will take you to that particular location. So, manning that place, or, you know, especially with soldiers, our soldiers, no precision, no enough technology, there are only 30,000, about 30,000 soldiers in that, in that theater. It's grossly inadequate. They are not well equipped. They are not well kitted. They are not well funded. In Nigeria, of 200 million, you only have 150,000 soldiers with 6,000 officers. Can you say we are serious? And then government is not making any deliberate effort. Why I say so is this is a war situation. We are, war with, we are at war with criminals in Nigeria now. The bandits, the kidnappers, and the, the, the Boko Haram as the top one. Nigeria have to stand up to address that issue and leave any other thing. Leave any other thing, I repeat that one. 
How can you be talking about infrastructure or be talking about development or all that? Is it not when you have peace that you can use those places? Now there is a road from here to, to Kaduna, but people can apply it. There are certain roads in, in Kaduna State that have been completely abandoned in Zamfara. You cannot follow. In even Borno, there are, there are roads that you cannot follow. So why do you do that road when people cannot use it in the first place? Economic activities cannot go on. So we have to put our priorities right. If the Nigerian government today decides that, okay, this Boko Haram is something that we will face, and before the rainy season, and that said June, we want to finish Boko Haram, and even banditry anywhere, it can be done. But as long as the government is playing the ostrich about this thing, it's going to consume us. Because you need to see now people are walking on the streets, protesting, even religious leaders. When I saw people like uh, Adiboye on the street, you know, it means they have been pushed to the wall. When uh, the governors will gather together and say they are forming Ometokun, or what do they call it? Ometokun. You know, if there were the, 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 their places are well policed, the issue of Ometokun will not even come up. We only have 370,000 police. In the, in the whole of Nigeria, with 200 million people. We have uh, 37 states, including FCT. So that means you have what? Barely just 1,000 1, 1, police in a state. Eh? If you go do an average. Because we have 370,000. Yeah, it will be about 10,000, really. About 10,000, OK. All right, so I got there. So 10,000 for the whole state. So Lagos now, if you put 10,000 police. So 20 and million people. 20 million people. Will it work? But, this is Senator, you are chairman of the Senate Committee on the Army. Yeah. And the Army has been called into service. Probably more than it expected to be called into service. There was yeah. a time, I think last year, the Chief of Army staff did say that they were operating in 32 states. And yeah, that's, up to now. Uh, apart from... Apart from some uh, uh, Operation Lafayette. Lafayette Dole. The theater. So, now... Um, and um, the M Joint Tax Force. The M, uh, yes. The and one the that Gambia. Is and yes. the Sierra Leone. Now, I, want, I, 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 I raise that because as chairman of the Senate Committee, you are able to look at it. You are not in the army, but mm. you have close uh, watch over them. Already you've talked a, a little bit about it in the interview uh, so far. But I want you to drill down on it. As it is now, the, the last people heard was when there was a controversy over uh, releasing money, taking money from the um, uh, country's reserve. Service, to service wide vote. On then, give, okay, taking money. Yes, to buy it <coughs> from the them. excess, yes, excess to crude account to buy the Tucano, the, the Tucano aircraft and all that. No, I, 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 I want to drill down on the army mm. because. In the case of Operation Lafayette Dole, that is the lead force because mm -hmm. they are the ones mm -hmm. who are doing the actual fighting on the ground. How are they doing? And how are they? That's two questions I've asked you. How are they doing? And how are they? Look, as I said up in issue, and I have been repeating that the Nigerian army are not equipped, they are not kitted. In spite of all this money that we're Which spending? is the money? When you budget 10 trillion and you allocate 100 billion for the Nigerian army in the service wide, and in the Nigerian army for the army sector, you budget another 100 billion, are you serious? I would say no, categorically. When you are at war, go and check other countries, even poor countries around us, like Niger, Chad, and Cabo, their budget is far. Because security is number one. After all, the Constitution says, Section 42, 14 to, that the primary purpose of any government is security and welfare of its citizens. Why are you talking about paying people when they cannot, they cannot go to the office and work? There are some people in my local government or many local government in Borno recently, they cannot go out to work and they are paid because... A force major, they cannot go, the local government, they cannot go and operate there. And it's not their fault, so it means you have to pay them for a service that they do not provide. As I said, schools have been closed. 
So what are you talking about saying you are giving money, money to the army? Look, it's like if this house is on fire, do you worry about the quantity of water that you need to pour in order to get the, wire off, the, the fire off? If you start saying that you should use 10 drums for this to put off the fire, you are not serious. You get water, pour it, some will go to waste. But the main objective is to put off the fire. I can tell you that from my interaction with the Nigerian Army. Look at it. Let me give you a simple example. Despite the fact that we say we have 150,000 Nigerian Army, and let's assume that 100,000 are deployed and others are still hanging around the barracks. In the theater there, the troops on ground are about 30,000. And the allowance per day eh, is 1,000. That is too small. Imagine somebody that is going there. If you ask a laborer man here or a taxi boy to run around, he can get 1,000. You go and put somebody at the war front and you give him 1,000 only as his allowance. Okay, let's say they are living with it because the Nigerian army don't complain. If you have 30,000 people and you give them 1,000 every day, 30,000 times 1,000, it's 30 million for one day. So for one week, it's 210 million. For one month, it's 800 and what? 40 million. That is just for that 30,000. That is just for their allowance. Supposing their salary, eh, is everybody a Nigerian is, a, is collecting 50,000. You multiply 50,000 by 30,000. That's 1.5, isn't it? 150 million for those 30,000. Yes, yes, yes. Eh? 50,000 Naira, if you multiply it by those 30,000, it's 1.5, not 1.5 billion. It's 1.5 billion naira. Okay. So for those in the theater, for one month, they need to be paid, you know, they need basically, that is for their personnel, their salary, assuming their they are 50% and their allowance. 840 million. Plus 1.5 billion. For 1.5 billion. For one month, it's 2.3 billion. And here you are budgeting. That is for that segment, 30,000. So when people start saying that you are talking about money, when we are talking about lives. In America, if they catch one American today, and they say the, the American government was, must pay $1 billion, otherwise they will kill that person. Quietly, the Americans will pay $1 billion than to lose the life. But if it's in Nigeria, so we better prepare an obituary. Now, but if, this, if the state of the army is the way you've, you've, you've described it, and, um, and now we are at this crossroads, mm -hmm. because before we had the Boko Haram, yeah. but as you've pointed out now, other things have since joined in. Yeah. That is not about the original problem uh -huh. with Boko Haram. Uh -huh. Banditry, insurgents, uh -huh. uh, the Kidnap kidnapping, excessive arm kidnap robbery, uh -huh. and so on. Now, and these are not things that possibly the army is, can deal with. This is not even an army problem. Dark. Even Boko Haram, up in issue, it's not supposed to be an army issue. And, but now that the army has been deployed, I, the president recently said, look, I think we're going to withdraw the army and allow the police take over in many of these places where some of these other issues where are. Where are the police? But the people said no, they don't want police. Yeah, it's in fact now, because, because it's only the army that can stand up the, you know, to, 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 to Boko Haram and the bandits. The bandits don't even care, about, you know, fear police. But let me tell you another thing, which I, we don't have the number. We must address the issue of the number. So if we have to address the issue of banditry and, 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 uh, and other form of criminalities that is overwhelming Nigerians now, we have to take the immediate measure. That is the quick wins or the quick fixes, you call it. And then we look at the medium term the strategy that we need to implement and the long term. The quick one is to address the issue of banditry and kidnapping. How? There must be special recruitment for that purpose. You increase the number of army and you recall other people that you can use for this purpose. What, why, who are those people? We have the vigilante, we have the hunters in, in, in every community. We have the retired soldiers and police that are willing to volunteer 
to come and address those issues. They know where the problems are so that you address it. Meanwhile, you all continue increasing the number of police in the country. You keep increasing the number of Nigerian army in the country to a certain standard which should be determined that we will be commensurate with our population. 200 million people. Eh, in a country like Nigeria that it prides itself as the largest economy in the DDG, that it is supposed to be the largest army in Africa. Here, Egypt have close to 500. Uh, Chad have good number uh, compared to their population. It is only in Nigeria we don't have up to 1% eh, of our population. We are getting to 200 million. And now the Nigerian army, the whole of Nigerian army is about 150. In fact, 130 something, or, uh, you know. Thousand. Thousand. The Nigerian police, 370. Egypt has 80, popula 80 million population. They have over 1 million police. Everywhere you go, you see a policeman. Will you start making trouble? Even if the police has no gun, even in this country. When you see people around that traffic, they pick pack anyhow. If they deploy police and police stand there, you don't see anybody there. The biggest challenge we have is the lack of law and order in the country, proliferation of arms. Nobody is, uh, is accountable for anything. But most importantly, the Nigerian police, the Nigerian army, and other security agencies are overwhelmed. The number is not there. We need to get the number, not to talk about their remuneration. They are not paid. They are not well paid, despite the fact that this government came in and, in, you know, improved on the salary. You are talking about minimum wage now, jacking it up to 30000 What happened to the Nigerian army side? How much would they be paid? What of the police? What is their welfare? Do you have police barracks now? Do you have army barracks? Even army is better. Look at the uniform of our police. They buy uniforms to themselves. The Nigerian army is the same thing. It's only recently. If you see the Nigerian army in town and the one in the, in the, war, uh, in the war front, they are different. Nigerian army are not well kitted. Some of those boys that sacrifice their life. And let me tell you, Nigerians are very patriotic. I have met these boys out there, how patriotic they are. There are so many in my villages. They are so committed. Can you imagine a small a, a, a secondary school or a, a Nigerian army from Oyo and Ondo? The, the one in charge is sacrificing so much. 192 battalion in Goza. He's a Lagos boy. They posted him to village. He has been there for close to three years now. Sacrificing his life. Do you know what? This guy goes, Lamidi, they call him. They go, he goes out of his way because the schools are closed. In that place that he's operating, he will gather children and start teaching them. But when some people sit down in their comfort, they start saying this is a Yoruba man, and then they say this is a Hausa man, just because they want to take advantage of people, they are out there. Senator, now because of all these uh, issues we've talked about so far, the National Assembly has now taken up this matter of security very seriously. Mm. Um, both houses, actually. Um, and then there were quite a lot of opinions on the floor yeah in the senate and in the house some of them very strong opinions and uh only after that the president then met the leaders of both chambers to discuss this issue of security and b just before that he met with the security chiefs um so i guess the issue of security is now almost getting to the level of it's now, it's now on the top of the table. What do we absolutely need to do now? Because there are those who pointed, when you mentioned Amotekun, there were those who said, and after Amotekun, the Southeast has said they are going to form something similar. Mm -hmm. uh, even the uh, Middle Belt. The Middle Belt have said the same thing. The, North, the, North, the Northern Governors Forum, as represented by Simon Lalong, say they are looking at it. Mm. Now, this possible proliferation of regional security outfits, some have said may not bode well for the country. But the main security problem that has led to people considering those kind of things as options is have the not fact been resolved. I have not been resolved. So people will defend themselves by saying, look, if you can't defend me, 
Why don't you allow me to defend myself? What do we have to do now to begin to show the people that we are tackling that these issues are being addressed? What needs to be done? If you have to make a PowerPoint presentation, what any number of things that need to be done immediately. You've, also, you've already mentioned that we have to increase the numbers. Number of the one. Army number and one. The police. Yeah. Number one is to increase the number of the army and the police, you know, to, to be of the minimum international standard. The United Nations standard, I think, to, in, in policing is one to 1,000, isn't it? So it means we need at least 2 million police. But we can't get overnight. The good thing about it is they are over 2 million Nigerian youths that would want to join or join the Nigerian police and serve the country patriotically, not because they are desperate on about job, but some that would love to be a policeman, more than 2 million of them. But as I said, the government must just live up to it and understand that the main priority of government or the, even the main reason why you have government is to protect the people and take care of their welfare. That is supposed to be the governor's, government's priority. I don't believe in politicizing issues. I don't believe that issue of security should be grandstanded. I, I did not even support discussing this issue of uh, security on the, in a plenary for the whole world to see. What would you say? It was full of lamentation, talking about people, talking about events. That is not supposed to be. You're supposed to talk of ideas. And this idea of Omutokuru registered security, is it going to solve the problem? Today, most likely, somebody must have been kidnapped. Or bandits must have killed somebody. Are, they, are we going to wait so they keep on killing these people? Boko Haram today tried to attack the Meduguri Damatru Axis in the morning today. They is what you got. And you people are talking about, say, is it, not, is it just going to happen overnight? If the president says, okay, you can go and form state uh, police, how do you do it? Where do you get the people? How do you train them? Or is it just like that? You have to amend the constitution. And if you amend the constitution, what are the processes? It has to go through the states, the House of Assemblies, the implications of it, the legal analysis. If this thing continues the way it is going, especially, you know, the first, this January uh, alone. This January alone, as I understand by statistics, that is the one we know. Over 320 people died in January, were killed, either by Boko Haram, kidnappers, or that kind of, 320. So that is not the solution. One thing that you cannot take away from this, Mr. President, is that he's honest. He has a man of integrity, and he's a patriotic Nigerian. Most of these people that are talking, they even have their houses abroad. They have their family, some of them stay in America. Most of them. Isn't it? A true Nigerian is supposed to believe in Nigeria as one entity. You don't fear that some of these people you take on when you talk like this would want to strike back at you. I, uh, as you're talking now, I recollect that you... You served a six-month suspension yeah. from under <laughs> the eighth senate uh, until the law courts restored you. Yeah, before eight months. That, eight months. Eight months. Yeah. Before that, uh, I went to court six years. They say I'm Boko Haram sponsor. Exactly. Look at it now. If you say I'm Boko Haram sponsor and Boko Haram is ravaging these pl places and you are leaving the sponsor here, you are not talking to the sponsor. Last time, uh, even Jonathan went to Chad to talk to, to the, the, the so-called fake this thing, and they, they, they took money and gave the only God knows the amount they went there to in, in the name. Because the, the Nigerian leaders, it's very unfortunate. I'm part of it. We deceive people. We are not honest. We deceive Nigerians. And also, the worst part of it is that Nigerians also deceive themselves. Because if you ask for accountability, in my own religion, they say God, you know, God, God, and the good thing about it is everybody, in Nigeria, you know, in Nigeria we don't have pagans. You can call us anything, but we don't have pagans. Because every Nigerian, no Nigerian, I don't know of any Nigerian that worship uh, idol. Our people only go to shrine. And that shrine, they believe God is there. Isn't it? And it's not like they have somebody that they go and worship. No. So we are religious people, and we believe in one God. 
Yet when people come around and start talking, they don't fear God. I, I don't think they even believe that God is there. Otherwise, this issue is something that we can... Look, other countries that are poorer than us, they are more desperate. If you have a poorer country, they are, so you are supposed to have more criminals there, isn't it? Chad, Niger. I went to Gambia recently. Very poor country. Even Liberia. I was there. But, because there is a relative commitment to security and welfare of its citizens, there is law and order. Here is a different thing. But people will want to blame your the, the government of your party. Which my party? Your APC. APC will come to clean up the mess and the mess refuse to be cleaned up. How can you blame us? Like if the place is dirty, you think that if you come, you put Omo and this thing to go. Then you start putting Omo, not the go. You buy, uh, what do you call it, jigs, or this thing that they used to clean, uh, jig. Yes. You put jig, you know the go. So, and the person that, that is responsible for, for, for messing up the, the place is telling you that, hey, you say you will clean the place. You, you now you didn't clean the place. I'm not going to slap him, even. Look at this man. He, he was the one who caused the problem, the mess. This is what PDP is doing. They caused the mess. Before PDP came in 1999, was the level of criminality in Nigeria like this? And they ruled for how many years? 16 years. So is it just because Buhari came and he's there for six years uh, or five years, he start saying, ah, you have not finished the job. You know what? It is more difficult to rebuild and fix something than destroying it. PDP was concentrating on destroying Nigeria for 16 years. You can imagine the level of destruction. Buhari came. There is no PDP man that will come out to say that this Buhari of a person is not sincere. This Buhari of a person is not patriotic, but he's human. Especially now that you have people that some people took over the government and much of them are kleptocrats and plutocrats, then you have more problem. So you, are, you also, you, you believe in the uh, existence of a cabal? No, it's not a cabal as such. As I told you, we have a system where Democrats are being overwhelmed by kleptocrats. How so? People that are there for what they can make to themselves. Okay. Not caring for what the generality of the people are concerned. Because some of them are not politicians. This is d democracy. Democracy is government of the people for the people and by the people. But now that is not the case. The president went around campaign and everybody. But when the president come, they lock him up. You know, they, 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 so it becomes a problem. Even those that are supposed to work for the president, and he believes in delegation of power and all, all that. These are people that are not reaching out. They are not, they are not as far as I'm concerned, they are not worried about what is going on. Why? If you have, Don't they it, have cause to be worried? I don't know. No, I don't think so. Because some of them don't even know Nigeria. They, are not even, they don't even know their places. They are not, you find some of them, they don't even go to their places. They don't even relate with their people. They are only people that are talking at the top. They are not politicians. There is element of truth in what you know, people are screaming that this is no, you know, the, as I said, Democrats in the government today uh, becoming minority and kleptocrats and plutocrats are becoming the majority. But if, 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 that, if that were the case, let's now take a look at it because you mentioned the president, you've talked about your party um, and what it's been trying to do. And therefore, I, I must now ask. There are those who have said the APC is beginning to rumble. Yeah. And that is because the glue that brought the APC together may, in fact, now be preparing to leave after the second term of President Buhari come 2023. But that there are people who are not even waiting until 2023 to start the rougho rougho fight, pardon my language. Um, is that true? Yeah, to some extent. Because Buhari is the principal, the key actor 
that brought so many of us together to form that APC. And I can say Buhari is 80% of APC. People like me, for example, and there are so many of my type in APC that are in APC because not of APC, but because of Buhari. I remember I was on what I call sabbatical leave in PDP. And it was, I didn't want to come back to anybody but to stay in the PDP and fight it on there. Then uh, when we formed the new PDP, I was, I think, the last person to be on the list, 22 of us. And it was Buhari that sent to say, look, come. Why are you not joining this, joining your colleagues? I said, me, I will not be in the same party with so-so person, because that person was there then. He said, are you not the one that say, if you want to fix a house, enter the house first? I said, yes. So he said, enter. Go and sign your name. <laughs> so you can fix a house from outside. Now we're in the house. And the master or the leader that brought us to that house is leaving. So you know that if we don't have somebody like him there that we can trust, then we're not small boys. I will not be sure of what it's going to be. That brings me to other issues. Yeah. Some of the fight mm. is about where the president should go, come from. In fact, there are those who say that the national chairman of the APC is having some of the difficulties or challenges he's having because some of the governors in the APC have their eye on 2023. And they believe that he will stand in the way of some of their ambitions if he's still party chairman by the time that decision has to be taken. I want your comment on that. I'm made to understand the APC has no zoning. So, unlike the PDP, the APC does not have zoning as an integral part. It's not of in the, the constitution, constitution, yes. It's not in the constitution mm -hmm, of the APC. Mm -hmm. Now, there are those who have argued that if you look at all the zones, only the Southeast has not had a taste of the presidency. By historical analysis, every other zone, either under the military or under civilian uh, administration, has had uh, a sustained. That's so it is the it is time to allow the Southeast. Are you an advocate of that? Are you joining those who think that way? But first, the first question I asked you, I want you to answer that. That is what? That's the one on the issue of what is going to happen with the APC. The ah. issue of the APC, especially now that no, you talk I told, about 2023 and the governors and the, and I, the I, I, I told you up in issue now. I, I do, see, I'm a Muslim and, uh, you know, a Nigerian. I don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. But all that I can say is because the party structure is not there anymore, the party has been personalized and privatized. If the strong person that will lead the party is not there, then there will be katakata unless he stands back. Even with that, the way we obey or we list it before, we know sometimes some of us will not list it again. <laughs> Especially some people like us that they consider as very stubborn. Now, as I said, I see Buhari like a, almost a father. You know, the thing about it is, you know, he's a soldier and my father was a soldier too and they were in the same division with Obasanjo. He was a garrison colonel in the, and we were in Port Harcourt. So we, I see him like a father. He, can, he would just say, shut up and I will have to. But if any other person tell me shut up, I will shout at him too because he doesn't have the right to do that. So when that person that can tell me to shut up is not there, you know, aha, they can be katakata as you said. But, but having said that, yes. the issue, me personal, this is very, very personal and honest. I'm a Nigerian. I'm a Nigerian. I believe in fairness too. But fairness is not from giving somebody the presidency order. Why this is happening is because there is no fairness. Senator Andume, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank it's, you very much. Thank you very much too. Thank you. That's today's episode of News Night. Thanks for watching. Do let us know what you think of the conversation. The handles are right there on your screen. Goodbye.